<laughs> you forget. I did. Um, there it is. I can start that chord of course. <laughs> I think, you know, as a, as a younger child, I was like kind of effeminate um, before I learned that that was like not how boys should act. Um, but it kind of just flew under the radar. And then I think by the time I started to go through puberty around like I was like 10 or so um, is when I was like, okay, I am attracted to boys. And I'm not sure how I should feel about that. So I, I guess I thought to myself, well, maybe this is just a phase and, you know, I can push past this. And eventually I realized that it was indeed not a phase and that, and that this is, you know, this is who I was. This is my queer identity and I needed to listen to that and embrace that if I was going to, you know, be who I was meant to be. I went to my first drag show, you know, maybe maybe a couple of years ago, and I can recall very few times in my life where I have felt that sort of elation and just like pure joy. Um, and then watching this fucking crossdresser like stomping the stage and kicking and flipping and lip syncing her her face off. Um, it was just one of the most simple, ridiculous things that, that brought me so much joy. And, um, you know, since then I've started to explore it for myself. Um, so I'm like not only an avid fan, um, but uh, I, what, what some might consider a baby queen. <laughs> As someone who, um, growing up struggled to really come to terms with my queer identity. Um, I, I feel fortunate that I have um, two gay uncles or gunkles as we like to call them. They kind of served as like a, a, a second parent unit. So while my father was working on the road um, and my mother was a night nurse, I would often spend a lot of afternoons, evenings uh, with, with them, my uncles Rick and Dan, having family members who were queer and, and understood what that experience was like, being able to come to them and, and come out um, just felt like, you know, like an ace in my pocket. Growing up, my relationship with my parents was interesting. Um, my mom and I were always very close. Uh, I think just because of the fact that um, my father worked um, as like a long haul truck driver. So I would see him just a couple days out of the week and we never really had the opportunity to, to build a strong relationship. Um, so uh, my mom and I were very, very close uh, when I was younger. And, um, you know, unfortunately she passed when I was only 12. So um, that was that made adolescence difficult for sure, and and not having had the a strong you know relationship with my dad at that point um, was an, another hurdle as well because you know here here I am left with this person who I don't really know all that well, who I don't particularly feel comfortable around, um, even though he's my father, and navigating that was and continues to be a struggle, for sure.
I'm gonna go creep. Alright. Yeah, this is weird. Like, this is like, I have literally walked this path like a thousand times. There's like still all the same like paint marks on the walls that were here like 10 years ago. It's really beautiful. It's almost kind of eerie <laughs> in a sense. Just that, that part of my life feels like it was so long ago. Like I feel so removed from the person I was inside these walls. Um, but at the same time, it's where the person I am now got my start. Pretty cool to see. I spent a lot of time uh, actively repressing my my queer identity and and what was sort of bubbling up inside me. Um, I had thought to myself, you know, I think I identify as you know, like maybe I'm bisexual, and maybe I can like get away with like just being with women uh, and just kind of putting this this other part of my identity um, in the back of the closet, as it were. And you know, all through high school, I dated girls um, through high school and into college and it wasn't until I was <clears throat> I was about 20 years old before or I guess I was I was about 20 years old when I started coming out and that was a process that took a few years oh check it out cool. it's big oh is that the pool Yeah, this is it. My God. Com completely redone. I was in a long-term relationship with a girl and, um, <clears throat> uh, you know, she was, for all intents and purposes, like my best friend. And, and I always felt really comfortable speaking openly with her. And, you know, one of the conversations we had, you know, before we broke up, it was where I had said, you know, I think I'm interested in, like, experimenting with guys and, like, seeing what that's about. Um, and she was very receptive. And, you know, eventually, you know, we did break up. And um, the breakup was a little messier than, <laughs> than that, for sure. But, yeah, I was, I was about 20, 20 years old but when I was like, okay, this is what I need to to explore and this is what I need to pursue and it's okay for me to start to be open about that and I had told some close friends and some family and started you know openly dating boys <laughs> scandalous <laughs> Growing up, my parents' relationship was pretty volatile. Um, they were both pretty heavy drinkers, and uh, they would often argue. And you know, I was privy to all of that. Um, you know, there were some times when things would get um, not just verbally violent, but you know, physically violent. I was on the receiving end of that. My mother was, unfortunately, on the receiving end of some of that. As much as my mother tried to make it, it was not always the most nurturing environment. My experience coming out to my father was, um, it was like kind of like, uh, like a Hollywood, like awful coming out moment. Um, his, his response was like really volatile and you know, he started yelling, like it was like, don't tell me what you're about to tell me. Um, and he started saying some hurtful things. He would be like, he's like, you know, your mother's rolling over in her grave. Like, I can't believe you wanna, you wanna spend your life like fucking men. Um, it was really vulgar. And um, I was just begging for him to, to hear me out. And I said like, I, we have to talk about this. Like, I need to talk with you about this. Even if it's not comfortable for you to hear, you know, this is something that I have to, speak truth to. This is going to be our final day, so make sure that we're working quickly. I see that most of us have already turned in. I'm going to sit on this.
So around the time where I had, I, I, I guess what you would call like my, my queer awakening, um, I was, uh, I was struggling with a lot of things. I was struggling with um, the ending of a relationship um, that was so influential and so meaningful to me for such a long period of time. And I was now starting to explore and embrace this, this queer identity and, and what that meant for me and what that looked like. And with all of that turmoil going on, I um, was working full-time while in school. I was working full-time hours as a full-time student um, just to pay the bills. And um, it took a toll on my body. And I, uh, a, a coworker of mine, when I was complaining, I was like, you know, my back is really sore. Because um, working in a kitchen, you get pretty tired. Um, and he's like, I have something for that. And that's when... Um, I started to casually use um, heroin um, <clears throat> and I think that was the beginning of a, of a slippery slope because while I was struggling with you know a breakup and, and coming into my own identity here was this substance that you know made me feel better that kind of pacified a lot of the not just you know physical pain that I was going through, but also a lot of that mental duress, and it was an escape, and uh, it led to something that was no longer casual, but eventually habitual. And that was uh, that was a difficult period in my life for about a year. So um, I had been using uh, for, for a little over a year and um, I was fortunate enough to have um, some very, very close friends, people who knew me deeply and, and cared for me. Um, I guess, you know, that, that sort of first incarnation of, you know, your chosen family, um, like my closest friends in college. and. Uh, they had recognized that I was struggling. Um, you know, it was something I was open with them about. I talked with them about, you know, my, my usage. And <clears throat> um, it just came to a head where, you know, I was like, I was uh, fucked up, like still trying to work full time and still trying to go to school and, and doing all these things. And um, they had recognized that like, this is not okay. Like Adam's gonna kill himself if he keeps doing this. And um, they cared enough to, um, <laughs> to corner me in my apartment. <laughs> um, <clears throat> I had walked in and I said, wow, this is amazing. All my favorite people are here. And um, they said, you know, maybe you should sit down. And I was like, son of a bitch. Um, and I knew immediately what was happening, but uh, I, I was coherent enough to recognize, like, these are the people that love me and they care about me enough to have this unimaginably difficult conversation with me. And that was enough for me, knowing that I had their love and support. And with them, and in a, in a large part because of them, I was able to, to get clean. And, uh, that was that. I think, um, I think one of the great struggles of life after coming out of the closet uh, is is not so much dealing with the aspect of coming out, you know, that's behind you, but really um, the idea of coming in and figuring out who you were meant to be on this earth and doing that on purpose. Um, it's a Dolly Parton quote and, and it just, you know, it just like resonates with my heart so deeply. 
but finding that genuine version of yourself can be can be difficult and it takes time and experimentation for for me i feel as though i've reinvented myself several times over the course of my life and the fun in that has come for me a after coming out of the closet ever since then it's been Uh, a wild, <laughs> a wild and, and fun ride overall, I think. Um, just like anyone, you know, we have difficulties in relationships. You have bad relationships, um, be it friendships or romantic relationships. Um, but ultimately, those are all learning experiences. And, you know, good, bad, and ugly, I'm thankful for where I am today. I think if my mom were still here, absolutely she would be accepting of, you know, the person I've become and, and you know, my, my being queer. Um, you know, I think she always kind of knew, low-key, and there were some ways in which, like, she fostered it. Like, you know, the woman taught me to, like, paint nails. So I feel like there was something there. Um, and I, I can only imagine if she were here today that she would just be completely accepting and loving. I don't think that, that given the opportunity there's anything in my life that I would change um, because at the end of the day it is the experiences I've had and the people I've known that have molded me into the person I am now and at 27 years of age I can say that I'm pretty damn happy with the person that I've grown into. If, if I were to meet uh, baby Adam today uh, as, as an adult, uh, I, th you know, <laughs> again, maybe trite, maybe cliche, I, I, I would tell him that, you know, Adam, you're going to see some shit in your life. Um, you are going to have some, uh, you, you You are going to experience some things that few people ever get to or have to go through. And there are going to be times when it's difficult and when you feel like you, you don't know what to do or how to do it or where to go um, or if you can really even get out. But everything that everything that comes to you is 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 there for a reason, and it's going to make you so strong. And sooner or later, you're going to figure out exactly who you are, and you're going to have the confidence, and the experience, and the grit, and the gall, and the tenacity. <laughs> to do that and be who you are on purpose, always.